Ladies and gentlemen, we, people of color, daughters and sons of immigrants, we belong to Europe. I am, we are the story of Europe. Hello everybody and welcome to this new episode of We Belong, the podcast that gives a voice to the new daughters of Europe. Today we are with an amazing and inspiring woman that is also a good friend. Her name is Samia Hafsawi and she is a journalist and also a TV presenter and a singer in the Netherlands. So welcome Samia. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I hope that you too. Yes, thank you so much. It's been a, a very challenging and inspiring time. Definitely. I mean, we met the first time before COVID, just before COVID in Amsterdam. Yeah. And then I quickly left Amsterdam and, you know, we all were thrown into this crisis. So how are you dealing with it right now with your work? And There's so many things that I feel like this year is so long. Because <laughs> there's things that happened in January, February, and I think back on it, like the the Australian wildfire, which was terrible and terrifying. And when we first met, actually, you know, we talked about, you know, our jobs and our life and how our year was going to be and kind of plans that we had. And things change so rapidly. Um, and I think that we are reminded yet again of the fragility of life. Um, Definitely. You know, at the beginning of the year, I was really looking forward to, to the American elections. I was really looking forward to Brexit. You know how, how much I love politics and world politics. And in the meantime, we've dealt with one of the biggest global challenges in our lifetime, surely. Um, or at least uh, yeah. one of the challenges that we are very much an adult <laughs> in. <laughs> um, because, of course, things have happened But now I feel like because we are older and we are more politically engaged, we kind of see what an economic crisis looks like. Because when the first economic crisis happened, I was, you know, a teenager. Um, Definitely. And I yeah. think that we are living, that's what I say many times, we are living in a year, a decade. Yeah. Like we are, and also I think as a generation, first of all, we're so politized we know a lot about what's happening around the world we have so much information and uh, social media yeah. where we can communicate virtually but on the same time there are challenges that we're facing and it's not only in our lifetime a crisis but also the worst crisis of the decade but because we want to also share some positivity and despite this year inspire our young uh, and older uh, listeners we are very very happy to share your story which for me is a story of inspiration I know that we have many things in common yes but we're, we're gonna unpack all these in a few minutes my first question is because in every episode we ask our guests a word that defines you or defines your work so what is your word for us today oh my god <laughs> <laughs> um i think my the word that defines my work is repartee okay why <laughs> repartee is a word that means uh, a conversation that is quick and witty mm -hmm. so um You know, you have sometimes you meet someone and then you have this really good conversation where you do a lot of laughing and there's jokes back and forth. And that's called a repartee. And and myself as a writer, not only for books, but also for screen, I really enjoy good repartee. So I really enjoy mm. writing very clever, very witty, very funny characters. Um, so I think that's the word that defines my work the most, because that's. That's what I write the most, or at least I enjoy characters that are like that. And growing up, that was what I saw on screen. So I loved mm -hmm. Gilmore Girls. I loved Tracy Beaker. I loved all of these shows that had characters that talked very quickly and very funnily. And uh, I, I've taken that and I've put it in my work. Great. And I know that your, your Anglo-Saxon 
uh, by you know experience <laughs> I'm your a big speaks. anglophile yes for the listeners <laughs> um i might sound very british i am not british at all um i was born in amsterdam my mother was yeah. born in amsterdam my family yeah. has lived in the netherlands for oof i did a family tree and we went back to like 1600 and then i lost all of the records um, wow, so crazy. my family has been Dutch for a very long time, <laughs> and my <laughs> very Dutch, very Dutch, very very Dutch. And my father and was born way- in 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 North Africa, um, in Morocco. Okay. So I am the daughter of a uh, of of Europe for hundreds and hundreds of years, essentially. Yeah, amazing, and that's why you are very welcome to our podcast, and we are happy to feature you as a daughter of Europe. By the way, as you said, we have this thing in common, which is that we are half and half. Yeah. I'm also Moroccan, but you are half uh, Dutch. Yes. And so what does it mean, really, for you to be Dutch? Like, I know there is so many stereotypes <laughs> so many we things, could yeah. throw. <laughs> but like, what's a thing that you feel like, oh, this is me, I'm Dutch, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think having breakfast and lunch with like a peanut butter sandwich is very Dutch (laughs) it's just like just very practical Um, Mm -hmm. I think what defines the Netherlands not only in philosophy but also in world politics is a sense of act normal that's strange enough it's something Mm. that we say all the time in the Netherlands just be yourself but in a way that really blends in into everything. Same as the relationship we have with the English language. It's we change for other people. We Mm -hmm. don't really have a very patriotic society. We know that we're a small country. We don't pretend to be more than we are. And yet we are very much a player on this global scale with a country that's only, you know, 17 million people strong. Um, yeah. So to me, that's it's a small country. It's the, very, the, very the, tiny. Yeah, and very close to other countries. So I know that you you are the we are surrounded um, by. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the proof that the, that the Europe is needed because you are and you know all your cultures are also influenced by Belgium, by France, in some way by the UK. Definitely, yeah. And Germany. by the way, you, the word you just mentioned, la repartie, it's in French, and I was very glad for you yeah. to mention it. <laughs> Our listeners, we have plenty of French people that will, you know, also enjoy uh, knowing that there is a word in French that is used also in English, yeah. la repartie. And so, you know, that's interesting how... At the same time, you have your own cultures with, you know, your uh, habits, for, yeah. for example, breakfast. Yeah. But at the same time, you also are a sum of many parts that are, uh, you know, inher- inherited by other countries very, and cultures. Very, very. And it's, it's a difficult relationship, especially right now where we are reevaluating what it means to be uh, of a heritage that has been disproportionately... Uh, benefited by systems like race theory especially in Holland you know we've had the the international trade and that's why we have become a very rich country and yeah. so you know also, uh, we, we know that historically also colonialism exactly. and um, the past that we need to deal with right and it's a it's very difficult to kind of you know, who are you? It's, it's a question that every single teenager, every single young person, especially now, who are you? And when you're <laughs> half something, especially half something that's looked down upon in, in the country you were born in, um, people will disproportionately tell you that all of your good attributes are because of that part of you that is born in that country so I'm half Dutch and people will say oh yeah you are you act professional or you're very kind or you're smart or you're funny anything because you're Dutch not because you're Moroccan no 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 because you're Dutch (laughs) and so when I grew up I started to see myself as half something but I am double something I am enriched with a culture my dad has enriched my life with his Moroccan heritage. My mother has enriched me with my Dutch heritage. Um, so I have kind of stopped saying half. I've, stopped, I've started saying double. Because yeah. these things live 
inside of us at the same time. We don't have Definitely. to turn the one thing off to then start up the other thing. Mm-hmm. And in, in a society that is very much racialized, that is dealing with things like Islamophobia, because I wear a headscarf just like you do, um, mm-hmm. we are asked to choose. Are you yeah. European or are you Dutch? Are you Moroccan? Uh, are you North African? Are you Muslim? Are you... Yeah. What are, like, all of these things that we choose... And, and, and a question that we always, always get, get is, choose a do side. you feel more Pick this side, or yeah. that? How do you feel? Why do we have... Yeah, how, why do we have to choose? Like, I was born in Europe. Yeah. I didn't choose. I was of heritage of two countries. I didn't choose. Can I choose how I want to define myself? I want to define myself as a double. And that's great. You do. So that's, that's you know, you are the product of all this. Yeah, we, and at the we same are time, a product we, of choices that we didn't make. Yeah, all of us are yeah, a product definitely. of choices that we didn't make. The thing is, mm-hmm. it's happened. So how do you deal with that? <laughs> how do you build definitely. on those choices? And mm-hmm. and to me, being a double something, <laughs> and, <laughs> and seeing a lot of injustice in the world, mm-hmm. and then knowing that you can speak from a place that is authentic, from a place that knows what's going on from a place that wants to bring healing and growth and joy, that to me yeah. is a, a big blessing. Because Definitely. I can use that Dutch part of me to say, hey, I understand why you are angry. I understand why you're sad. I understand why you're upset. We are reevaluating traditions, norms. We are reevaluating our entire media structure. But I can also say from the perspective of You know, a girl that's part of one of the one of the most demonized groups in our society, I can say, hey, this is not okay. What's happening right now, nothing about this is healthy or constructive or normal or natural. Um, and marrying those two together and bringing much needed softness into the conversation is mm-hmm. something I take great pride in. Definitely. And, you know, you mentioned many important things. Authenticity, but on the same time, bringing joy and bringing also this perspective, this double point of view uh, on the table is super, super inspiring. And by the way, good to mention that you don't only uh, do this via uh, media, as I said previously, you're a journalist, but you also wrote um, a book. Yes. And I would love you to explain a bit more about it, but also why the reason behind this book. As you said, you know, identity is something that for a long time shaped you. Who am I? You just said. And so finding an harmony, it's, it's something that many young people are asking themselves. It's a, a question super important. And so you also wanted to ask and reply to yeah. some questions. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us more about your book. Yeah. What's the name? So in, in the Netherlands, I work as a TV presenter, so I work full of TV shows. And, yeah. uh, but I've always wanted to be an author. And it's really funny because they say it's easier to become famous and then get a book deal than the other way around. So I was like, okay. So at first I started <laughs> working as a television host and then I wrote my book. Um, when we speak of hijabi representation in media we we tend to focus on the problematic trope of a girl with a headscarf meeting a most of the time white boy uh, who is not muslim and then she takes off her headscarf we see this yeah. in the society elite hala oof there's so many the movies so many examples and yeah. um That happens, and that is very valid. I don't want to speak ill of any other people that write or direct or anything. However, it's very sad and very um, disheartening because we don't have any positive representation of a girl that wears a headscarf that is very happy and secure with that choice. And mm-hmm. in a society, uh, in, in Europe, in a world, basically, where Islamophobia and aggression towards Muslim women that wear the headscarf and Muslim women that don't wear a headscarf, um, where the violence against them is heightened, um, I found it really important to write a book where a girl 
falls in love and has all of these emotions and these feelings and has a very important conversation with herself about what love is and what her relationship with with boys is like any other teenager but all the while being very secure in her muslim identity mm -hmm. and i i work as a screenwriter so i write tv shows and i write series and films and when i work with other screenwriters they always say yeah but i just can't imagine a story with a girl with a headscarf other than her taking the scarf off yeah that's for us that's what you want to uncover i think it's also Part of it is also like a desire from uh, people who don't wear a scarf. Call it satirism, like call it anything. Yeah, to, uh, it's, to it's like this what's big behind. secret, like it's a secret, like I want to know what it, yeah. what's there. But it's really sad because... It's also Orientalism, right? Yeah. Like I want to uncover this woman and be like, I'm your savior. <laughs> yeah, I, like, want, I want you to be like me. Free. But then, or free or <laughs> anything. But I found that very sad. And it's also a big reminder that people see women with headscarves as this religious product. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they, they, but they we are still you on human. This, on this box. Like, we can slay dragons. We can fall in love with the prince. We can save the world. We can... You know, the first <laughs> university was started by a Moroccan woman. Like, we can do all of these things. We are all of these things. Yeah. And even if we are not extraordinary, even if we never save the world, even mm. if we do the most ordinary things in the world, we are still human. So if you are a good screenwriter and if you can write and imagine people complexly, you should be able to yeah. imagine a Muslim girl complexly. So I just want to mm -hmm. encourage people to, when they see Muslim girls, you know, we see it on TikTok, we see it on Instagram. These girls are like extremely talented, funny They are curious. They are mm -hmm. amazing. But we keep reducing them to girls that hate their fathers and want <laughs> to leave their religion. And again, that is valid, but it's only valid if it's as tiny of a part as it is in the real world. Exactly. There is a stereotyped image of what a Muslim woman is, especially related to the Middle East and how women wearing a veil uh, are often... Uh, portrayed by media but also in society but then is, also uh, american girls are these these the society elite you know hala these are american stories these are spanish stories these are european Definitely. stories and it's, it's just really it's really sad yeah. just really sad that we keep perpetuating and keep financing this stereotypical thinking not understanding what we are doing to these girls that are seeing themselves on screen and are either seeing themselves as an instigator of terrorism or are seeing themselves as someone that hates their entire identity and it's just really 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 disheartening so yeah. my pleasure and joy of a lifetime mm -hmm. is to change that to challenge that to give girls a book it's called 36 questions and uh <laughs> a lot of coffee uh, <laughs> that's the English <laughs> the English title but it's in Dutch to give yeah. them you know a story that they can look up for free and to see themselves in a way that how they are because this is who how we are, they are in all of our in all of our love and celebration of our identity um, so I'm very and I think very also the that. yeah I think also the unicity of them like what does it mean to be a Muslim male woman Is there just one type? No. And that's There's what we so want to many. prove by yeah. questioning and asking questions on what does it mean to fall in love. We also fall in love. We also, you know, there is so many stereotypes on, on us. And also, we do all the as I was normal saying, people do. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We also, you know, have fun, not like people would think. But, you know, there is this stereotypical image that is linked to another context, which is the, which is the Middle East. And that's why for me it's important to distinguish those two contexts we as european women of course i don't want to generalize again but you and me i can say we had a choice even on our religion choices i know that you were raised by two parents who were from different religions and it's the same for me and then i made the choice to wear a veil and to practice my religion which it can be even buddhism i don't even have to 
to tell it. But just because you wear a veil, you're often targeted as the oppressed woman. And so that's what mm. you try to change through your book, 36 questions that I really encourage everybody to check, especially Dutch people, because yeah, it's still in Dutch, it's right? Enough. Yeah. But we are waiting for the English version, so we I can am also too. read I would it. love to start the English version. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. This year has been absolutely crazy. I'm writing a children's book and I'm starting to... Uh, to write a musical in January for the Delamar Theatre, which is a huge, beautiful theatre in Amsterdam. Um, I have Definitely. And by the way, I know that you are a musician, so and yes, a, I am. also a yeah. singer. So please tell us more about it. And I'm very passionate to know that you, you really use culture and arts to express many important messages. So please tell us more. Yeah, so um, we, oh, a, a friend of mine had been working on a movie for seven years and it's an incredibly beautiful story and she's amazing amazing and she's so talented and we finally um we finally were on set just a couple of weeks ago which is crazy it's called Miskina. it's coming out in january um, amazing january 21st to be exact and i i had a good relationship with the director and the director asked me to make a, a song for the film And so for me, it was very emotional to see, you know, an idea my friend had for, for seven years to become a movie and then for the director to ask me to write a song for it. And it's a film that has a, a very big cultural value because in it, it's, it's a story, it's a Dutch story, but it's a story that is full of amazing people that have their heritage from Morocco. So these okay. are a lot of people that are bicultural, just like you and I, people that have Moroccan parents, um, people that have Moroccan passports, <laughs> people that um, <laughs> that are Dutch. And I, I want to really put emphasis on that because these, you know, we are, you are as Italian as, you know, I am Dutch. And it's really important yeah. to remind people of that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's one of the first movies in Holland that is a romantic comedy that is starring people of bicultural heritage. Mm -hmm. And so the song is at the end of the film. I don't want to spoil it, but the song is at the end of the film. And, and for me to be a girl in a headscarf, holding a guitar, playing guitar, uh, singing a song that I wrote is very special because I always had this idea of if I want to be a musician, I have to take off my headscarf. And I don't. Yeah, you, you can, can be, be anything. You can be yourself yeah. and do what you want. And also, I really appreciate the fact that in every work that you do, you often put this uh, idea of identity and multicultural uh, heritage on the table. Um, and it's something I think that for a long time you questioned and today you use it as a tool to spread awareness on what diversity is and also what being Dutch is, because for you, i mean yeah i don't you, you want I to feel change like as the next person yeah yeah <laughs> but it's, it's it's very strange um to to live in a country where one part of you is is so looked down upon yeah um it's so so incredibly looked down upon do you feel it on the street yeah i feel like it on a daily street. basis i feel it when i work with other people i feel it in with my co-workers when they ask me certain questions Uh, when I work with magazines, often they ask me questions that they wouldn't ask anybody else. In interviews, yeah. they ask me questions like, um, you know, mm -hmm. what does your dad think about you being on TV? What does your husband think about being on TV? Are you allowed to do this and this <laughs> thing? Uh, were you in an arranged marriage? It's all of these kind of suggestive questions, you know, like kind of prove yeah. to us that you're not oppressed, prove to us that you are free, prove to us that you are a good human. And it's, um, it's very stressful oh. and it's very sad. Um, but I also find great joy in, in educating people and in proving, you know, saying, hey, we can, we can live together and share yeah. this love and joy. And we don't always have to agree, but we always have to respect each other. And there are certain mm -hmm. things that we all have to agree on because that's what it means to be European. That's what it means to be Dutch. There are certain things mm -hmm. that we hold as truth and one of those things is personal freedom mm -hmm. religious freedom personal freedom freedom to love the order. freedom to share mm -hmm. freedom to be who you are and that is a give and it's a take um yeah so i would like to you know 
say to other Muslim youth, be who you are unapologetically, but also in your pursuit of acceptance, accept other people as well. If you encounter something that you don't know, if you haven't seen, learn. Just like mm-hmm. we would love for other people to learn about us. Other people would love for us to learn about them. So let's keep it a circle. Exactly. At the same time, ignorance can be from both sides. Exactly. We don't know as much as they don't know. And we also need to, as you said, respect the freedom of the others, understand and acknowledge that a woman can have a brain and the right <laughs> to choose what she wants to do. Exactly. <laughs> no matter what her husband or father or whoever male uh, of her family or her surrounding things and that's important and it's also part of a patriarchal system that we need to also to criticize and to exactly. um, question things are right? things happen intersectionally yeah you know you can be Definitely. so many things at the same time and and a lot of the time because we are in this kind of heightened state of reevaluating our identity and questioning our identity sometimes exposing things about ourselves that are not the good side Yeah. of a community or of, of a certain group of people is scary because you feel like you're already being attacked, right? So you don't mm-hmm. want to give people ammunition to attack you. So it's very difficult to start a healing process within the community. Um, yeah. My book discusses the father-daughter relationship, which is very important because our parents, you know, they, they come in with all of this trauma, Because moving to a different country is very traumatic if it happens under very, very difficult circumstances. Definitely. And so we have a generation of parents that is very scared mm-hmm. and are very alone and sometimes, sadly, take that out on their children. Yeah. And, you know, we have governments that really didn't pay attention to this problem. We have, you know, children that are not emotionally equipped with dealing with parents that are full of trauma um, yeah. and we don't have parents equipped with recognizing their trauma mm-hmm. but it's really difficult because how do you speak of a problem in your community when your community is already so wounded by other people and this yeah. goes for a lot of communities that we see around us Mm. Um, and I yeah. think it, it also, as you said, it's super important to talk about intersectionality especially because if you are an immigrant son born in a country where you are a minority and seen as a minority. On top of that, I'm sure that unfortunately many immigrants and immigrant sons, they are not that rich when they arrive because many come to Europe for economic reason, not all of them, but many of them. So when you add all those elements into the balance, then it's way more difficult to think about your mental health when your priority is getting food on your table, you know? Exactly. And so I think it's super, interesting how you have is this approach of healing right mm-hmm. and at the same time uh we spoke about your work as um a notor we spoke about your work as a musician and a singer and on all these you always bring this you know focus and this priority which is giving back struggling to change society <laughs> and i think it's also crucial that we mention that you are a journalist and that you wrote for many uh, mainstream um, newspapers and magazines, yes. among them Vogue and Glamour. Um, Cosmopolitan. How, yeah. yeah, and Cosmopolitan. So how was this experience, how is this experience, and especially arriving there as a minority? Yeah, it's very uh, complicated. It's incredibly complex and it's, mm-hmm. it's not something that has always been very enjoyable okay um and that's very complicated because and they've said this themselves so i feel like i can speak on this a lot of magazines are reevaluating their relationship with how they have depicted certain you know marginalized yeah. groups and yeah. so changing things from within yeah and i know it's complicated it's, it's so complicated to process. change things from within yeah right but i'm very inspired that you're struggling to do it you're so young you're 25 i think i'm 26 now yeah 26 happy birthday you. <laughs> you're 26 and you are doing all these on your on your shoulders it's a lot but on the same time it also can inspire other young people yeah and as we it's it's uh, been so nice to 
you know, I stand on the shoulders of a lot of people before me and I've had amazing colleagues that I've worked with these magazines as well and these TV shows and and you kind of, you know, you take a bit of the burden. So they yeah. chipped a bit away from the big mountain and I chip a bit away from the big mountain and then at the end, this mountain of ignorance and, and you know, doesn't exist anymore and then we could, we're all equal. Um, mm. And it's really good that, you know, these magazines, these TV shows, these publishing houses, all of these, you know, they've come out with statements saying, educate us, and then we can say, pay us. Yeah. Because yeah. so many times this burden of re-education and free labor has fallen upon uh, the people of color to fix things, yeah. especially black people. And it's really nice to now see that people are respecting our time, respecting our knowledge and respecting our labor. And I'm happy to say that every single day something else happens that gives, you know, light instead of darkness. Mm -hmm. And it's a long road. It's a really, really long road. Um, as we see all around us, countries that are making choices that are very much less than ideal. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, when it comes to equality and prosperity for all people. Yeah. But we should not remember that most of us are good. Most of us want to say, I love you to other people. Most of us want to spread love. And most of us want to celebrate not only ourselves, but our neighbors. And that's really what keeps me going. Just to think that as much as I try to make things that change minds, I also really want to make things that make minds stronger and more encouraged in what they already think and what they already think is I am worthy and we should celebrate that in, in you know, our daughters of Europe. And, yeah, exactly. And on top of that, that we belong. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I think it's, it's just the message that you want to deliver and it's a long process, a lifetime uh, mission that you have. I'm very, very inspired to know that despite all the struggles you go through, you want to achieve your goal and you're very committed to this. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sure many young people will find this uh, inspiring and motivating. Um, I would just like to conclude our episode asking you, um, or actually asking yourself, because you spoke about who are you. Mm -hmm. So if you could ask to your younger self or actually give her an advice, what would it be? What would you tell to the young Samia uh, 10 years ago? I think I would say that all of the things that I found to be useless, so my love of writing, I didn't think I was ever gonna do anything with it. My love for TV shows, my love for film, all of these things that I did be because they brought me joy, I didn't think I would turn that into a job. Yeah. And then Jim Carrey made a speech and he talked about his father and how his father wanted to be an actor. But he his father chose a job that was more secure. And then his dad lost his job. And then he said, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said something along the lines of, if you can get fired from a secure job, you might as well do something that you love. And that really inspired me to to say, you know, this pandemic has proven that nothing nothing can give you security you have to create yeah. your own security so be secure in the things you love and you'll never spend a day working in your life amazing yeah do what you love and it's so crucial there is so many young people contacting me even mothers that tell me mm, what can my <laughs> daughter do and i'm like what she likes exactly people young people should do what they love and that's super powerful your message and i hope that many young people also will uh, understand that because we, we, we often hear, oh, journalism, um, writing, it's a field where it's difficult to find a job. Certainly it is. But when you're determined to you have your own idea, and no matter your uh, diversity, the fact that you are from a minority, that you wear, wear a hijab, if you think you belong there, then work hard and you're going to make it. Exactly. Right? <laughs> Samia, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We're very, very happy. And uh, let's stay in touch. Yes, please. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. You too. To conclude, I am happy to share with you my key for today, which is the YouTube channel of Tia Taylor. 
You can find her on YouTube and she teaches um, financial literacy and how uh, women should invest. It is really, really important that we all learn uh, these skills. So I really encourage you to check it out. This was the end of our episode and you can find us on all platforms and on social media. Bye.